Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and I don't want you to miss an upcoming episode, so please hit that subscribe button. And while your phone's out, please do me a favor and give us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It says, hey, this podcast has a great message, and we should send it out to more people. So please take that 30 seconds to a minute to do that review, and just maybe by doing that, it'll push this up into someone's podcast feed that really needs this message. Now let's jump into this next episode with my very special guest. All right, welcome to Enduring the Badge Podcast. My very special guest today is James Boomhauer. How you doing, James? I'm well, man. How are you? Doing good, doing good. We're just chatting about the weather before we got on here. (laughs) And uh, James is in the eye of the boom cyclone. Is that what they call it these days? Yeah, yeah. Some some crazy boom cyclone nor'easter combo thing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully by the time this airs, he'll be dug out. That's it. If you don't hear from me, then you know I'm still still buried. Right. You and half of the East Coast. Right. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself, James. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is James Boomhauer. I am a critical care transport specialist paramedic out of Boston, Massachusetts, and I run a mental health and suicide awareness advocacy campaign and social media following called Stay Fit for Duty. Yeah, and James has been in the business for a few years. You got started really young. I did, yes, sir. Yep, I um, I actually started in high school. Uh, I my first couple shifts in an ambulance were part of a career exploration program, and I just kind of stuck in from there. I had family that were first responders. I had uh, extended relatives that were in medicine, and really, really wanted to help people as soon as I could. So got my certs as early as I could get them and, and have put in just about 18 years now in EMS total, uh, 15 years as a paramedic. And yeah, started when I was when I was a wee kid. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Wish I would have started that early. And I have a lot more years right in the system. Right. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot more years in the bank. I should have yeah. gone right to the fireside. I would have been 20 and out much earlier. Yeah, I, yeah. I did a, a longer walk through. Yeah. So James, what was it when you were young that like said, Hey, I want to do this. I know you had some family in this and that uh, is serving in as first responders, but what was it on those ambulance rides that got you interested into becoming a paramedic? Uh, That's a great question. I think it was the like immediacy of impact. I mean, you, for anybody who's listening to your podcast that doesn't do any type of first response or pre-hospital emergency medicine, you're literally one of the first handful of people to come up to someone in an emergency, be it you know a life-threatening emergency or something a little bit less severe. Um, and the, the ability to be the first pair of hands and the first um, person to not only help, but recognize and ensure that as, as medicine continues to get more convoluted as we go, that the correct pathways get followed kind of in the role that you play. Um, was just really powerful. And I really, I really liked the fact that it was so raw. Like you were the first person to stop the bleeding, the first person to, you know, do CPR or perform any aid or any other much less glamorous task that we ask our EMT paramedics (laughs) and firefighters do every day. Um, But it wasn't, you know, seven steps removed. It wasn't, well, I'm a, I'm an emergency room doctor and 14 other people have interacted with this patient before me. It was, I'm one of the first. And I, I really liked that part. Yeah, that, that you do make an impact when you're definitely the first on scene to render some aid. So you went to flight medicine. What? Why did you take that jump? I did. Um, so, so like I said, I took a very convoluted route <laughs> through through EMS. Um, uh, EMT card straight away. Got my paramedic um, certificate licensure right after that. Um, practiced as a paramedic for a little while. Went and completed my undergraduate degree. Um, thinking that I was going to go to either medical school or APP school to be either a PA or an NP. Um, And throughout the connections that I was making um, in undergrad and in the services I was working at in New England while I was in college, um, I I started to see some programs that really allowed paramedics and nurses to practice at the absolute like peak of their license level, like modalities that nobody else does, but drugs that nobody else can do. Um, and the program that I'm fortunate enough to work for now uh, is a combination uh, rotor aircraft, um, traditional plane aircraft, and ground. 
uh, vehicle uh, transport team. So we're not limited by what we can take. We're not limited by what we can do. Uh, we're really fortunate to be one of the teams that is a jack of all trades and really doesn't have a patient population that we can't serve and with some uh, really sincere acuity. And that kind of amalgamation of the whole thing was really what I wanted. I mean, I definitely thought flying was cool, um, but it wasn't my like, I just want to be in a helicopter. It was really, this is a, a program, an agency, an institution that'll allow me to practice care unlike any care that I'd be able to provide anywhere else. Yeah, that's pretty cool that you get to do all the different things. I mean, that's pretty rare, I feel like in on the flight medical side of things to be able to fly, you know, both fixed wing and rotor and do ground transport. That's seems to be not the case so much here out on the, on the West coast type of thing, but that's with having the ability to do all those things, which is your favorite? That's a good question. I, the, the, the smart alecky comment I was going to make was it doesn't make for peaceful <laughs> nights, right? Like when, yeah. when, when you can get to a patient any way, shape or form, you always yeah. get to your patient. <laughs> right. um, you know, I think that they both, they both have pluses and minuses. I, I tell people that are interested that when I'm in the ambulance, in the critical care ambulance, I'm almost always dealing with a very, very medically sick person. Like these are very like complicated intensive care unit level cases or cath lab level cases um, where there's a lot of real medicine that needs to be done. Um, where on the aviation side of the coin, my medical intervention there is time. So be it a traumatic injury or, or something that really needs, you know, definitive surgical or interventional radiology intervention. Um, so they both have, you know, their own, like, do you really want to get barred down in the medicine and really try to figure out, you know, all this complicated medical stuff? Or do you want to do uh, not really the more down and dirty, right? But the more, you know, the scoop and grab and, and yeah. do everything that you can while you're kind of in this more high speed, low drag environment. So it's a yeah. really cool, cool mix of both. Yeah. I mean, I don't know too many medics out there that wouldn't want to fly. Like that yeah. is such a, I had an opportunity when I was younger to be a helicopter mechanic and I, I loved it. I loved being around helicopters and they're just so cool you know, to, to fly in the feeling in the, that you get. And I think it would be awesome to come in to do those scene flights, you know, it, agencies call you because they need the next metal of, level of care possibly, or they need to get this patient to the hospital immediately. So yeah. do you really enjoy those? Do you get flights like that where you can go to scenes, medical scenes or we do. Yeah, absolutely. I apologize. I think it's Zoom land. I cut you off a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, uh, being in New England and being that we have so many hospitals so close by, um, we definitely do a lower percentage of scene than we do in our facility, um, but they still happen. Absolutely. Um, and that's a really good point as someone who is, who's been in EMS for a long time, like myself, you know, you, it's great to be able to like be the person on the other end, right? I remember being yeah. a paramedic <laughs> and calling for, you know, whatever my aeromedical transport was and like, I didn't want to upset them. I didn't want to look stupid and I hope I didn't like call them. You know, you only have like <laughs> yeah. this eight minute long, like crash interaction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's really cool to be on the other side now and to be able to be gracious and kind and, you know, really provide some help for, for people that really, really need it. So uh, we certainly don't have, you know, the, the percentage of of scene calls that maybe some of us would like, um, but that's just because our our paramedics uh, on the ground side of the coin would be sitting there staring at the hospital <laughs> waiting for the helicopter to come. Yeah, yeah. So, so we do a bit more modified and then inner facility stuff as well. Yeah, and it's just very dependent on far geographically where your helicopter is located as far as how many, I think, scene flights you get. The more rural area you cover, of course, the more scene flights you're going to get just because of you know time and distance that you can be saved, you know, flying someone in a helicopter. With going through on the, all these calls with these very sick patients, how does that affect you? That's a good question. You know, we, we talk a lot about that on the, on the air medical side of the coin of kind of what, what a bad call is, right? And, and how bad calls affect everyone differently. Everyone has a different definition of what a bad call is. Um, if we want to get as broad brush as humanly possible when we talk about um, what, what is considered a traumatic call, quote unquote, we look at calls that are, you know, uh, change our worldview, right? Change how we kind of see the world that are around us, calls where we felt helpless or, or trapped or weren't able to provide, you know, the necessity of care that we like. Um, we work really hard to have a really robust peer support team at Boston MedFlight, and we work hard to have, at a minimum, institutions and foundations where clinicians can support one another. Um, I, I think it's really part of a holistic 
like it all matters, right? Like right, how, how is right. your shift going? Are you rested? Are you hydrated? Is, is everything else in the world going well? Um, Cause you know, the adage that I, I often remind people is, you know, the local fire department's worst call of their year was my Tuesday morning first run. Yeah. Right. With yeah. four other calls that day and three other shifts that week. And that is certainly in no way, shape or form meant to diminish the severity of that call. Sure. But you know, you talk about the the accumulation of that call on that call on that call on that call, and um, if you're not careful, I think it, it really can weigh on you if you're not cognizant of you know, giving yourself the space to to take the stress away from that call and and leaving that call somewhere, processing that call, and then you know going on to the next one. With running call after call like that, how do you find the time to to process you know those bad calls? That's a great question. It's, I think it's very, very individualized. Um, I'll say one of the most like paramedic E traits that I have is it takes me like three days to process a bad call. Um, I am a paramedic, right? I have another call to go on. I yeah. have, you know, other staff I have to help. I have homework I have to do, right? <laughs> and, and I just kind of like throw it somewhere like retro perineally until like three <laughs> days later, I can't figure out why I'm upset. Um, so acknowledging that is super helpful and, and my close colleagues, my friends, uh, colleagues of mine on the peer support team, uh, I have a pretty good sense of like, okay, like I'll check on Boomer right now, like immediately after the call, but he's not going to need anything until, you know, the shift <laughs> is done and everything settles. Um, that's not how everyone processes, right? Some people need time, like in the immediacy and some people kind of need time in between. Um, but for me personally, um, one of my coping strategies, I guess we'll say is, is I can stay pretty well mission focused. Um, and probably 90% of the time until the shift is done, I'm home, I'm showered, I've worked out, right? I've, I've done all the stuff. And then you kind of open up that box and you, and you give it a minute to kind of let out and go from there. Yeah. Get a chance to actually sit down, relax. And I feel like that's, I mean, I could, like you said, right, can take days to actually just unwind from a busy shift and feel rested and in a moment where you can take the time to, to process those type of things. I want to go back to something you said, you know, like, you know, some things that affect you is like being hydrated, your food, your sleep and stuff like that. I mean, I totally agree with you. Like if you're not kind of in your most prime state and you're at work, things just seem to be more impactful. Do you, do you find, do you find knowing that about your, your peers, you can see the kind of the difference in them when something's bothering them? I think so. I mean, I I think a lot of places, certainly not specific to Medfleet, do a really good job of, of reinforcing the fundamentals. I mean, even like some of the camp standards that we have to follow as aeromedical programs, you have to have 10 hours of rest between shift one and shift two, right? Now we all know that I can't come home, you know, and be like, nobody <laughs> yeah. bother me for nine hours and 58 minutes, right? Yeah. But, but at least some, some of the guardrails are there. Um, at MedFlight in our, our daily shift briefing, we ask one another, are we rested? Are we hydrated? Are we fed? Um, the terminology we use is, are you fit for duty? Are you, where are you? And, and with a little bit more comfortability, you can look your partner in the eye and be like, I'm 70% today, right? Yeah. Like I'm, yeah. I need, I could use a 20 minute nap. If you don't mind right. checking the truck, I'll get a cup of coffee. Um, and, and I really think that on top of knowing that foundational component of like what you need to come into work and do work well, to add that second layer of, I also don't feel embarrassed or stigmatized to tell my partner, right? Like right. I, my partner's not gonna think less of me if I come in and I'm like, I got no sleep last night. I'm exhausted. Jerry and I tried for 20 minutes to get the Zoom call to work right before yeah. it ever turned on, <laughs> right? Everybody's stressed. And um, now, now I'm at work and, and I'm just like a quarter step from where I need to be. Right. Um, obviously with, with the space that I run and, and what I try to advocate, I, I beg my partners to tell me that, right? I, I want to know where we all are so we can both help each other. Um, and I'm no stranger of being like, hey, if you can get me a cold brew on the way into work, yeah, <laughs> that would yeah. be so tremendously helpful because <laughs> I need another little kick to get us started. Um, but, but just recognizing that as part of, as part of your early training, um, it, it is discussed in like early um, board certification training for flight medics. Like they, they do a bunch talking about how flying affects you physiologically and how nutrition and hydration um, really play a role into that. And we try to play off and say, you know, that that's not just a chapter 10 in your exam review. Like this is actually <laughs> something that really matters. Um, so, so we do a good job of making sure that we can, we can hammer home those fundamentals because you're absolutely right. It, it calls will affect me differently when everything is copacetic versus when yeah. everything is off the rails. 
And yeah. I often think that we we far too frequently overemphasize really complicated things at the expense of some of the more straightforward and really foundational things. Have you gotten any rest? Are you hydrated? Have you eaten anything? Yeah. Yeah. That I know each one of us want to show up to work a hundred percent, but we have lives outside of, of work that may make us so we don't show up a hundred percent, you know, having a young family, you know, or having family issues or whatever is going on may not let you come to work a hundred percent. And I, I, I love that communication of like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm 70% today, you know, and I, and I think as a, as a company officer, I, I like to know that too. I'm not going to judge them because they're 70% because, you know, life is happening and stuff, but it's just good to know where their people are at. So, you know, what kind of their expectations are and how things may affect them. Absolutely. And, you know, on, on the leadership side of the coin, I, I, I'm certainly fortunate to talk to leaders that are like, well, Boomer, what am I going to do when like you come in and tell me for the fifth shift in a row that you're a 20%, right? Yeah. Well, then, then we have something that we have to deal with. But if I'm, if I'm in a space where I'm terrified to tell my company officer that I'm tired and I'm dragging on a fire call, right? Or I'm 13 steps behind the eight ball or asleep driving the ambulance, right? I mean, I'm yeah. making like <laughs> catastrophic examples, right? Yeah. But yeah. You would much rather know where I am. So you can help in any way, shape, or form. And then if right. it's something that becomes chronic or abused, right, we have policies, procedures, and platforms in place to fix that. Um, it's certainly not an easy mix. I don't think every human that walks into any any place ever will look at a perfect stranger <laughs> or somebody they don't super trust and be like, hey, here's some of my weaknesses and my faults. But I think it really matters. And and people have to remember too that you know with, with eight years on a job, your 80% is probably still really good. Right. Yeah. Like you're probably yeah. still pretty okay. Um, conversely, a hundred percent on your probationary year probably still needs a bunch of work, right? Cause yeah. you're still probationary. Yeah. So recognizing that, you know, you just have to be able to tell yourself where you are every day and in a perfect world, what do you need? Right. Right. If I can right. just get 20 minutes, like I'll be yeah. like, back yeah. up and ready to go. And then if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Right. Cause that's always right. when we get a call is when I say I just, need yeah. 10 minutes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it really, uh, you know, just to echo back what I said, it really, it really can be that simple in the immediacy. How do you set up a culture at work to, to let people be so vulnerable about how they're feeling? Um, it's hard. It's hard. I, I, I would be lying if I said that every member of where I work uh, is like, oh, I'll tell everybody everything, you know, we're a just culture, we're this, we're that. Yeah. Um, I think it takes a ton of time. I think it takes a ton of patience. Um, I work really hard to lead by example. Um, all of my, my coworkers that are, you know, paying attention to this stuff, listen to the podcast that I'm on and, you know, really hold my feet to the fire of like, okay, Mr. Health and Wellbeing, why did you pick up a fourth <laughs> overtime shift, right? When you can barely walk in your boots, like, like <laughs> yeah. a disaster. Um, so I, we try to practice what we preach and we just work really hard to like help one another. I think one of the, the beautiful aspects of what disaster we want to call the last two years in first response in medicine is there is no judgment anymore for saying I'm just tapped out. Yeah. Like I, I think it's a, it's a universal acknowledgement and kind of a, a leveling field in the sense of no one is going to judge you in January of 2022. If you're in healthcare and you tell me that you're tired. Right? <laughs> right. Like so, so knowing that I, I think kind of pulls away some of that barrier and, and allows people to have that conversation. And you just try to help as genuinely as you can. And you try really hard to not blow smoke up people. You know, I, right. I would never tell anyone that I work with that, you know, I can fix you and come here and we can do this, we can do that. <laughs> but I'm the first one to be like, here's how I can help. Here's who we can talk to. And how can we all get through this together? And for the most part, at a crew level, right? At a, at a you know, provider to provider level, that works pretty well. Yeah. Did you, at, at your work, did you start the peer program or did they have a peer program set up before you got there? Uh, no, I was, um, I was one of the individuals that helped create it. Um, so we were able to start it from the ground up um, with a ton of growing pains. Um, <laughs> took a handful of years to really get um, accepted by the leadership. Um, and then it takes a little bit more time to get accepted throughout the institution. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of a trust, but verify species at baseline, right? Like, yeah. we don't think anybody's lying to us, but we're also <laughs> going to be super, super careful. 
Um, and we work really hard to make sure that we are not acting as some talking point for our leadership, right? Like, it's not fair if my leadership can just say, we have an industry leading peer support team, but then actually not help me and my, my members of the peer team support the peer team, right? right so so right. we work really hard to, to make sure that that happens. And um, we've been incredibly fortunate to help a number of our colleagues. And I think what is what is changing now, the shift we're starting to see is more and more people saying, hey, if you need anything, like, you know, there's a team, like, it's not a big, it's not as much of a hurdle as it used to be, at right. least in what I'm seeing, which I hope isn't too rose colored because of my position here. But <laughs> um, what I'm, what I'm hearing from my colleagues, what I'm seeing is, you know, there are people here to support you. There are ways that we can help one another and, and kind of re-encouraging this, this development of teamwork at the ground level and going from there. Yeah. How long did it take you to get your peer support team to where they are today? Like, is it, like you said, it took, it was kind of a little bit of a painful process and stuff like that. How long did it take you to like get the structure set up? It's like, if I'm new at a department and I'm looking to set up a peer support team, how's that going to look? Like what, what kind of time line do I need to like plan on? Yeah, it, um, it really depends on who you talk to <laughs> within our agency <laughs> of when it started. Um, there were uh, members of, uh, of my agency that uh, tried to get this ball rolling years before I'd got there. Um, and and I, I don't want to say it got shot down in a negative light, but it got, you know, kind of put to the side and forgotten about. And then um, it kind of reemerged and we kind of dusted off this old platform and said, how can we, how can we actually make this happen? Do we have all the right people in place, the right leadership on board? Um, and from that moment, from like gavel down from the CEO, um, it took us probably two years to become official, I'd say, like from yeah. this is the day that there's a deployable peer support team and, and we do all this stuff. Um, and then it just evolves, right? We, we have a, a network where we'll analyze calls that are dispatched. And we ask our uh, comspec leadership to look at those calls and say, hey, Jerry and Boomer just went to a dead child. Right. So when they're done with that call, we're going to ask them if they need the peer support team and we're going to you know, offer them whatever resources they need off of that. We've continued and, and continue to kind of tweak that delivery and availability of both people and resources as my coworkers and my colleagues see fit. Because um, it doesn't super matter if it works really well on a flow sheet that I made, right? <laughs> if none of my coworkers or colleagues want to use it. Um, an example yeah. that I can give really quick is that um, uh, we, in our initial iteration, we never gave anyone the chance to say they were okay. Uh, we said, do you need support right now? Or do you need support later? Without ever thinking the option <laughs> that somebody was just fine. Yeah. Um, and, and that actually took a little longer than I care to admit to like build into the platform and say, no, no, if you don't need us, we're, we're not knocking down your door, right? This isn't like involuntary, you know, check-ins or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, but that, um, that whole process took, like I said, uh, a couple of years, it could definitely be plus minus. Um, we are super willing to share kind of our trials, tribulations with people that are interested. We work with um, other local agencies that are trying to start peer support teams. We look to other peer support teams to see what they're doing and, and what they like. And our, our medical direction on the uh, mental health professional side of the coin um, is always super helpful on, on changing and adapting. So um, I tell everyone that's interested, it's a marathon not a sprint. Um, yeah. You certainly won't start it in two weeks, um, but it doesn't have to take two years. Yeah. I do like one thing that you, you said is like, you have a way to analyze the calls that people went on and then figure out if they need peer support. That, I think that's very unique. I don't know any other agency that's really maybe analyzing the calls, like hearing the dispatches and being like, oh, we should think about that. We should think about maybe they'll need peer support and at least just take the second to ask them, hey, do you guys need peer support? You guys good? I really like that. I think that's something that everyone should implement into their, you know, their peer support that would, that would be awesome. I think for, for us, it was, you know, the one thing we want to do is we want to um, distract or stress out the provider as little as possible, right? Like uh, if, you, if you've already had a terrible call, the last thing I need you to do is like, well, who's the peer supporter and who do I have to call and how do I have to do it, right? So um, unfortunately, the trade-off there is we further burden an already tremendously burdened group of communication specialists, 
right? Like I, I, yeah. I work for years on this thing <laughs> and I hand them this list and they're like, cool, another 10 things I have <laughs> yeah. to do for each call. Um, so, so we are also trying to balance and be really empathetic with the fact that um, what I hear when my crewmates come back and what our communications team heard right, are often two very different things. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, like we, we've gone to stub toes that have spontaneously combusted and been the most dramatic call of someone's entire career. And we've also gone to, you know, oh my God, everyone's dead and there's blood everywhere and the crew's yeah. like, no, it was a hangnail, right? So, yeah. so it's, hard yeah. to, it's hard to really specify that, but it, it gives us some semblance of a net that says, hey, at least there are eyes out. And you, know, you and I talked a little bit about culture change. One of the, the next pieces of culture that I'm seeing a bit more is people more willing to reach out if they weren't paged. Because what, what initially happened was if someone didn't get a page, they assumed that, you know, it wasn't that bad or yeah. they didn't need anything or somebody forgot or, you know, and there's all this animosity there instead of now just being like, Hey, I didn't hear anything, but like, I'd love to talk to someone if you had a minute. And that's really my goal. I, I personally don't care how we get the support to people. I just want my crews to know that 24, seven, 365, there are dedicated people on shift to make sure you're okay. Yeah. At the crew level. Then yeah. So how as a flight medic or a firefighter or first responder, how can I build some, like recharge my resiliency and like build resiliency? So fundamentals are huge, right? Like making sure that you're in check is really important. Um, I am a big, big fan of very intentional. I'm at work. I'm not at work. Um, I say that as a member of the education team. I say that as one of our newer preceptors. So as I'm like, you know, extending myself more and more into work. Um, but like I take my boots off at the door, my flight suit comes off and I'm not a flight paramedic anymore right now, right? I'm, I'm a boyfriend, I'm a friend, I'm a homeowner, I'm all these things, but I'm not a flight medic. And I think it's important to start by building those boundaries. That email does not need to be checked. You know, flight, <laughs> flight medicine is notorious for CQI that just goes on and on and on. You do not have to answer that email right now. You do not have to respond to that phone call right now, right? You can take very intentional time and give yourself the space and rest you need. Um, the fundamentals like you and I talked about earlier, are you hydrated? Are you rested? And are you fed? Uh, what I remind people is the more stressed you are, the calories count more than the quality of those calories. So if you're at like peak stress level, terrible call, you're really having a hard time, any food <clears throat> is better than no food. Uh, with the caveat that you can't eat Snickers and pizza every day. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to be on the cover of Men's Health anytime soon. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's not looking at, you know, the Zoom meeting right now, but yeah. Um, it, what I don't want people to do is I don't want people to not eat, you know, because they're trying to find a salad that they left back at base. Um, right. Once, once you have your, your foundation in place, um, it really is just time to process. Um, one of the newer things we're working on um, at MedFlight is the idea of an end of shift checklist and not operation. Like what went well, what went poorly, what do you need and how can you get it? And by, by putting really well-defined start and ends on each of your shifts is a really good way for you to kind of turn down this warrior mentality of I'm the protector and I have to help all these people and I have to be constant on all the time. And you can kind of turn that down to a dimmer switch of like, I don't need to be that right now. I am not going to be asked to go in a helicopter and intubate some crazy complicated airway. I'm not going to be asked to go to the ICU and start flow land on this really sick <laughs> COVID patient. I'm just James. I'm going to be asked to go to dinner with my girlfriend and clean up the house, right? Like those yeah. are my objectives. So those, those boundaries are really helpful in turning down that uh, hypervigilant state that we live in and allowing us to reprocess, which gives us the strength to come back in for the next shift. Yeah. I like the end of shift checklist. I think that's super cool. I think that would be, something i think sometimes it happens informally but some kind of mm -hmm. maybe at the fire department level is like an end of shift thing would be would be cool to sit down as a group see where we're at and then to sit down as individuals you know before we head home so we so we arrive at home kind of in the right space i mean i live five minutes ten minutes from my station so i don't have a lot of time to decompress and stuff by the time i get home and if I'm tired, you know, I walk, walk in the door and my wife can already see it on my face, you know, that I'm tired. And then 
she knows try try not to talk to him too much let him go take a nap type of thing but yeah, yeah <laughs> having some kind of end of shift routine i think is very helpful to get you out of that hyper vigilant state and to try to bring you down as much as possible i think that's would be great if i didn't have to check my emails and text messages and all that type of stuff on your on your days off so you totally could decompress but i don't really know of too many places that are that are like that you know especially when you're for me when you're working a little bit smaller department you're always have more than just one job so you're always you know in the mix of some kind of communication about some something going on absolutely and um I, you know you you had a guest on your show destiny uh, a couple months back we talked yeah. a lot about you know provider relationships and um one of the one of the things you alluded to you know what i call the provider safe word right it's like my thankfully my girlfriend is in flight medicine so it's easy right the, she knows the acronym <laughs> she knows the job she does it she knows the day was good or bad before i got home but we're also really transparent of like i'm just done don't ask yeah. me to do anything i need this, that, and the other thing when I get home and then I'm going to bed and I love you, goodbye, right? But you can build that in any relationship. Um, it, it takes practice, it takes time, it's, it's not easy. I don't mean to, to um, sure. misconstrue that it is, but, but you, can, you don't need to be married to someone who's really empathic, right? To, to have them look at you and say, oh, you can, you can create that plan, you can execute that plan. Um, and it, it can really, really be valuable with the, uh, like yourself, you know, I do five, six jobs at work and, and I can't always avoid my emails. Um, what I can do is I can choose when I answer them. And I pulled all of my work email notifications off my phone when I'm off duty. Yeah. Um, that way, if I have five minutes, right, I'm, I'm, you know, waiting for the laundry to get done or whatever, and I can open an email, something I can answer. Great. But I promise you, and, and you know this too, and so do many of your listeners, if work needs you, they'll get you. Right? Yeah. They, will, they will pay you, they will call you, they will call the house. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, don't ignore your boss, right? Don't, don't ignore your battalion chief if he's called yeah. you three times. Yeah. But you might not, we often think that we have to answer these emails and these text messages right away um, when we can perhaps leave them sit. Or right. if I can't, can I give myself a chunk of that day where I don't? Right. Like Jerry and I were talking at 11 Eastern at nine o'clock, my email shut off because I want to take a shower. I wanted to, you know, do a couple of things before I sat down and talk with you. Yeah. It was not the time to be rummaging through my email five minutes before we were live. <laughs> so can you put those, those boundaries in there to help kind of reinforce that time? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you for, for the most part, I turn off my notifications like period on my phone. I hardly get any notifications unless I choose to, to look at them, look mm -hmm. at them. Although we have like a, it's called I spy and it just goes off at every call that happens in the city and I'm a fire investigator. And so I like try to monitor, you know, the things that are happening and stuff like that, if I need to be available and stuff. But lately I just like, I've got to shut that off because I just have got to not have constant notifications of what's going on at work and what calls are happening and stuff and just take a step away and, and breathe. I think we really we really have a hard time like you know you know taking your flight suit off and coming home and being a boyfriend or being whatever you know we have a hard time leaving that type of stuff behind us we it becomes our entire identity and we take it into our family and everywhere we go so i like i said i like really like building in routines or things that people can do to just decompress by leaving that someplace else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a practice. I, that's the only thing I tell everybody else is it, I did not come to this in a day, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. that, have, yeah. that have been my, my coworkers, and my colleagues for decades, right. They, they laugh when I say this stuff, They're like, but do you remember when? Like, of course I do, man, I'm, I'm working, I'm improving. I'm trying to get better every time. And and if you have a day where you're you're on, you know, the dispatch ring for the entire day and you know every ounce of flame that is launched <laughs> yeah. in the entire city, like that's okay. Yeah. Just try to get, you know, know when you can extend that and know when you can't. But, yeah. So the other kind of the, the last little component of that is this idea of giving yourself some grace, right? Like you you've been a professional first responder and you you are trained and practiced in being hyper vigilant all the time. You can't just turn it off. It's yeah. not that easy. That's why I say it's a dimmer switch and not a light switch, right? Because it just doesn't right. just come off. Right, you kind right. Of calculate the intensity. Um, so when you have a day where you're way off the mark, when you have a day where you've done all the things that we just said you probably shouldn't do, that's okay. Grab a glass of water, grab a cup of coffee, 
and make an effort the next time to do a little bit better and then a little bit better and go from there. It's not a pass fail. I did or I didn't. Yeah. I, I like that. Giving yourself a little bit of, of grace. I think far too often we, we don't do that. And maybe we find ourselves if we're not giving ourselves our own self grace that we're not doing that. You know, when we look at other people too. Exactly. Exactly right. I, I, far too many of us are notorious of being super kind to other people, um, well, really hard on ourselves, and then we look at that a little bit deeper, and we're like, actually, we're also being pretty hard on that other person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. as we're going through it. Yeah. What um, you work several different jobs and stuff. It sounds like, and then how do you have hobbies and stuff that you do, or how do you like work? Get in this like a peaceful lifetime, you know, like a little bit of <laughs> James time to go do something. Like, how do you squeeze that in with all these different jobs? Yeah. Um, it changes, right. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge cycling advocate, uh, indoor, outdoor. I like to do that. Um, Jerry and I were just talking. I, I was a little sick a couple weeks ago. So my first time back on the bike was today and it was awful. <laughs> it was <laughs> metrics that I won't share with anybody and, and wheezing and coughing that nobody should hear. Um, I am a new homeowner along with my girlfriend. So that is kind of a new challenge, right? Like, what are we going to do? And what's what's going to get done today? Um, other than that, I, I look at a whole bunch of different ways to keep my physical fitness up. Um, right now, I'm, I'm bigger into weightlifting than I've been in quite some time. Um, and I, as weird as this sounds, uh, am in graduate school. I, I'm working on a master's in psychology to become a counselor. And that has forced me to pull away from some of the other stuff. It sounds insane to think that homework in any way, shape or form is actually a helpful tool, <laughs> but like you have to sit down, you have to read this, you have to sit down, you have to go through this. And it really reinforces this, like, I'm a provider, I'm a student, and then I'm a boyfriend. And you know, we're, we're doing sushi, we're doing this, we're doing that. So um, I just try really hard to make sure that my identity doesn't get marred only into those three things <laughs> and, and make sure that I get some time on the bike and that I you know <clears throat> spend some time with my friends, drink some good coffee and like go out and see the world sometimes not on right. one route to a base or a hangar. Right, right. Um, what made you take this next step going to back to school? Um, I really wanted to help more. Um, similar to kind of the, the analogy that I gave with like going to med flight, like I really enjoyed being a paramedic, but I saw that like I could, I could do that at the peak of its level. Um, I love peer support. I love crisis response. Uh, I'm a member of the crisis text line. Um, I just really, really enjoy, uh, pardon like the, the poor metaphor, but like the idea of like the mental health paramedic, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have a little bit of training in, in you know, some psychological first aid and some really specific aspects of crisis wellness and you deploy, right? And you help people when they're an extremist and you go from there. Um, the idea of a culturally competent clinician who can not only help see patients formally licensed one-on-one, -on -one, but who can also then help guide other peer teams and guide other programs, not as the peer supporter, but as the actual mental health professional that needs to be there. Um, that was really, really what, what brought me to it. And I, it was the right time. I am fortunate that I have time to go to grad school right now and, and the means to go to grad school. So it was kind of the, if I don't do it now, it's never going to happen. <laughs> so um, that's, that's the plan. The plan would be to, to become a mental health professional alongside a professional emergency responder and do those in tandem to, to provide the best care for both that I can. Yeah, that's, you're going to be a busy man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ask me about health and wellness in like a year and a half. Right? Yeah. To make sure that I'm still hanging in. Do you think your experience is going to make you a better clinician? I hope so. Um, I think, um, and if anyone here is looking for a counselor, right, I think the idea of cultural competence or essentially in layman's terms, like, do they know what it's like to be a paramedic, right? Like, do, does yeah. my counselor know what it is to be a firefighter or a paramedic or a police officer or in the military. Um, I think it's really important to remember that that can be overstated. Uh, I have had phenomenal counselors that I had to walk through every acronym, every, you know, <laughs> this is what this is. And when I said this, I mean that, but they were just a great counselor and we jived really well and, and I got really good help from them. Um, I've also had really terrible therapy from people that advertise themselves as like the paramedics counselor, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they were, this was their, you know, cream of the crop and this was their jam and, and we didn't get along. We just didn't have, you know, great provider patient relationship. Um, so I, I always am cautious to say that 
the idea of cultural competency is great in knowing your field and knowing the people you're interacting with and kind of understanding the profession and the stressors there. And I think are really helpful. Uh, and I do truly hope that it helps me be the best uh, mental health professional that I could be. But I, I say that to not shun people away from what could be a wonderful therapist, yeah. but doesn't know the difference between an engine and a ladder, right? Yeah. Like, just tell them the difference between an engine and a ladder, right? You don't have to walk out of their office. Um, and and I, I worry because, you know, like like so many of the other guests on your show, right, we all hammer home this idea of cultural competence and, and how important it is to have this understanding before you walk in. We can teach that to mental health professionals that are already very strong. And we can then, you know, capture it and absorb it with individuals like myself who come with a very strong background in this space and also want to then evolve and become a mental health professional. So in short, my answer is I really hope so. I really hope yeah, that it helps, no, I, helps me be the best I can be. I think I think it will. I think like Destiny was Destiny Morris was saying on her episode is sometimes you're just not going to jive with your therapist and that's okay. Like you're going to need to find somebody mm -hmm. new. It's just like you're not going to sometimes jive with the dentist you go to. You're just not going to like his style and stuff. So you need to go find something new unless you want to endure some terrible dentistry or endure some, you know, taking your time to do some mental health care for yourself and not actually benefiting from it. Yeah, people, people all too often forget that. And, and Destiny is a perfect example of somebody who, who, you know, wasn't in the field, right, but has a, a tremendous immersion in the field through her lived experience and her, her tenacity and learning about it and, and kind of where she lives in the profession, because you can't tell me that the significant others of us emergency responders are any less of an emergency responder than we are. Right. But, you know, it, it's so important to remember that sometimes you just don't jive with someone. It doesn't yeah. mean they're a terrible therapist, although I've, I've certainly expressed that opinion of, of bad therapists <laughs> that I've had before. Um, but it doesn't, it also doesn't mean that you're so broken that no one can help you. Right. And, and I think the only safeguard that you put in there is, is when you start to have this, maybe I should talk to someone kind of in your ear, you do it sooner rather than later. So you're right. not in a state of crisis right. and you're not, you don't force the clinician to, to be at this like impasse of, I either do everything right or it's all over it, and I think because we were, it's stigmatized and it takes a while and, you know, we're still really maturing into this idea as a profession um, on the emergency responder side of the coin, that it is, it's not that easy to just go early. And that's my best advice is go early. And if you find a great counselor, yes. If you don't, then leave. That's okay. Yeah. Give them a, I, I always say, uh, give them a session or two, right? You have to sit with somebody at least more than once. Unless right, it was the right. most abhorrent, you know, sit yeah, down you've yeah. ever had. <laughs> and, and make sure that everybody jives. And if they don't, you can literally ask the mental health professional you're with if they have another recommendation. Like the, it, it feels personal and it feels rude, but you can ask, is there anyone else in your office? Is there anyone else that takes my insurance? Is there anyone else through employee assistance or anything like that? The, those questions are perfectly appropriate to ask of one another. And I think in the 911 world where you don't get a choice, either Jerry shows up or James yeah, shows up, right? Yeah, it was whoever's yeah. working that day. We forget that you have that option. Yeah. I, I like how you recommend going sooner than later. Um, it took me uh, 28 years, 29 years, basically, to actually, actually even more than that, almost close to 30 years before I actually went out. I didn't have anything that I felt was bothering me. But I felt after so much time, there has to be things that are bothering me. So I tell like our newer members of the department, like, I know you've only been here for a year or 14 months, but you should go like you should go like early and maybe a little more often than somebody like me waits too long. Because if you can keep that mess, I'll call it a mess in your head sometimes cleaned up, then you're going to have a much better better career a much healthier career and be able to give more and then be able to not just give more to your patients but give more to the significant others that people in your life exactly exactly right and i i think it just hopefully culture is changing where people feel more comfortable about doing that you know um I think sometimes the, the stigma of like there's just talk therapy that's the only therapy that was out there for so long and um so a lot of first responders, I feel like they don't want to talk to anybody after they're off shift. They want to be like more secluded. And last thing you want to do is go talk to somebody about, you know, their, their problems or how they're feeling. What, 
what's your kind of favorite like uh, type of therapy? That's a good question. I um I primarily seek um, mindfulness practitioners. Um, so not formal talk therapy in the sense of like lie on the couch and like tell me everything that's bothering you, but, <laughs> but more of a conversation and then how you can reframe that conversation in your head. Um, I personally feel it gives you, you the person a little bit more control, which would probably not surprise any of us that that's where I'd like to be. Right. <laughs> yeah. The idea of like, you help me show me how to fix this kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. In, instead of just like giving me a prescription, uh, as far as like, you know, you need to do these three things and then you're going to be fine. Um, but you're right, there are mental health care comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, there are, you know, group counseling sessions that work really well for people. They have group counseling specific to first responders uh, of every shape and size that work really well for people. Um, they have immersive activity styles where you go to, say, a horse farm and the group session kind of happens while you're working with horses and, and laboring and doing all of this stuff. Um, there is like good old fashioned traditional like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And like sit on the couch yeah. and talk about it. I, I really think, I think um, mindfulness and, and CBT are, are a good like start. If you had like no idea where to go, I would start there um, and then work your way through it from there. But, but there certainly is no wrong way as long as you feel safe with the individual that you're talking to, um, you feel that, that you can trust them and they can trust you and that you understand that you always have options. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there are just so many different types of options. And I do like the mindfulness stuff. I do practice that, you know, myself, I think if we feel like we're just going to be able to go to therapy and be, that's going to be the end all thing for us. I don't feel like you're doing yourself a full, full service is like, you can't just go to therapy. You have to do a lot of inner work yourself. And, you know, that takes time and patience with yourself. And it's, like you, like you were saying, you know, you always want to be better and stuff. And so just, just try to be better each day, each be, give yourself more grace, just try to work on yourself continually. I, I feel like most people are still trying to do that. Everybody's trying to bring their best to work or to wherever they're at. They don't intentionally come to work or whatever, and not, you know, not bring their best. Absolutely. There, nobody is trying to be a slob kebab the whole day right? Yeah. Not, not a soul, right? We're all giving it all we got. We are putting in, you know, whatever we can put in, we're dealing with everything else that we have going on. And right now, my God, that list is long for, for everyone. <laughs> right. And um, that's kind of important to understand overall, you know, it, is it easy when, you know, a colleague of mine is driving me nuts because they're tired or they're not paying attention or whatever, or am I driving a coworker on my nuts <laughs> yeah. because I'm really hyperactive and like all over the place? well, what's, what's actually going on there and how can I be helpful and how can we, you know, kind of make that work together? And sometimes that's, you know, being more helpful. Sometimes that's being less and kind of letting it go. And um, it is just helpful for everyone to remember that, you know, well, well, we don't want to give anybody excuses, right? Nobody's got a, a pass to come into work drunk or anything, yeah. you know, yeah. over like that. Like we're all really just trying to do the best we can every day. And if, if we, we look at everyone with that lens, I think we get a little bit more judgmental and a little bit more empathic as far as how we can help those people. Yeah. I think far too often we maybe see things from our perspective only, and we don't really take into account like looking from their perspective or another person's perspective of, of what's going on. We all know, like if you watch, you know, there's been some documentaries done on like, Hey, watch this bank robbery, you know, and you be the witness. And then they show all the witnesses, you know, including yourself, you know, you're what you're kind of taking down and doing and like, we're all terrible witnesses. We're all seeing something totally different. Like, yeah. And it just happened in front of us. And I, I try to like tell my guys out a lot, just like, you know, we got to look at things in a different point of view sometimes to understand where patients are coming from or where our coworkers are coming from. Exactly. Exactly. I think it's a really useful tool, especially to build in the earlier you can um, the thing it takes away some of that kind of harbinger and that, you know, really negative attitude of the me versus the patient or me versus the caller, right? Yeah. Instead of me, you know, working alongside that person that's in need. Yeah. James, what couple of tips could you give someone listening to maybe start implementing in their lives, very, you know, very soon? Uh, first thing, every single time anyone ever offers me a microphone, it's okay to not be okay. That's thing one. Like that just needs to be your caveat. The idea that like helpers can't need help, the idea that like I'm a protector, so I can't ever need help. It's 
antiquated, it's wrong. Step one, give yourself the grace to recognize that you need help. Um, if you do need help, I don't mean to, to project that on anyone. <laughs> um, step two is just know that there are so many resources. Um, I, I don't think it's a it's a stretch to look at any of my stuff, any of Jerry's stuff, any of the countless people that live in this space and offer some help. Um, just don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. That right. is really, really the first thing. Know that it's okay to need help, but don't be afraid to ask for it. And then remember that early on, especially in crisis, the things that we can do to be helpful are super fundamental. And well, you may need more or less help depending on what's going on, the, the earlier parts are really, really fundamental. Making sure that you're getting rest, making sure that you're staying hydrated, that you're, you're able to put down some food and then recognizing if you're not, if you know days have gone by and you can't do that, there, there's your sign, right? Now, now you need some more help and now we can start to work at it from there. But it, it is okay to not be okay and there are resources and people willing to help you and ready to help you. Yeah, I think there's just so many resources now that you can find one to fit your style and maybe or fit the mood that you're in to how you feel comfortable about reaching out from calling, texting, gosh, you know, or actually physically going in and seeing somebody. There's just so many different ways to get help. James, where can people follow you on your journey to getting your degree and being a clinician? Thank you. Um, a couple places. Um, I am most active on Instagram and Facebook. Um, Jerry has all of my uh, info that I'll put in the show notes, but the handle is uh, stay underscore fit, the number four duty. Um, that's where 99% where of my stuff is in there. I also have uh, a link tree to some of the podcasts I've done and some of the other work that I've done. Um, I've been super fortunate to ask to write uh, a chapter for an anthology on mental health. Wow. Uh, so mid-February, I'll, I'll be able to have some, some details out if anyone wants to purchase a book on mental health in kind of the totality of the scheme. But I, I write a little essay there on healthcare providers uh, that is called Scars to Stars. And I'll, I'll have plenty of information to that when, as soon as I get it, I'll get it to Jerry and I'll get it to everyone else. Awesome. Um, and then I can always be reached out uh, by email at stayfitforduty at gmail.com. Very good. Very good. James, thank you so much for being on today and taking the, the time and sharing your, your knowledge and your, and your wisdom. Jerry, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate you reaching out and I'm glad we were able to connect. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. You too. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast. If you know someone that would be great on the show, please get a hold of our host, Jerry Dean Lund, through the Instagram handles at Jerry Fire and Fuel or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. Also, by visiting the show's website, EnduringTheBadgePodcast.com for additional methods of contact and up-to-date information regarding the show. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show solely represent those of our hosts and the current episode's guests. This podcast is part of the Everyday Heroes Podcast Network, the network for first responders and those who support them.